G'day, Tom here from Reformers Bookshop with another Reformers interview. Today we're in the office of David Burke at Christ College. Thanks for joining us, David. Great. Thanks for having us here in your office. It's my, my pleasure. <laughs> uh, and you teach at Christ College. Can you tell us a bit about what, what you're teaching at the moment? Sure. So um, my official title is Lecturer in Ministry and Practice. That covers a range of things. I say to people, anything but the Bible, which usually you get some uh, smiles. <laughs> so this semester I'm teaching early church history. Okay. I'm teaching a course in applied theology called Church in God's Mission. And I'm teaching a course in pastoral skills. Yep. Okay. Mm. Pastoral skills. What is, what is uh, that that, that's, that's pastoral care, caring okay. for God's people. Um, yeah. Here at college we see the work of a pastor as being to feed, lead and care for God's people. And so that pastoral skills is under the care heading. Sure. Yeah. And I guess under what we're going to talk about today is would be under the feed head. Yeah, correct. Because right. we're, we're yep. going to talk about books about preaching. Yes. Yeah. Um, so perhaps <coughs> to start with, can you can you tell us what is preaching? Hmm. Um, yeah. Well, that's something I get students to write an essay on. So as I read the essays, I've had to think about it. Um, I talk about preaching in terms of it's the explanation, the illustration, and particularly the application of God's word. So. Preaching is always going to derive from the scripture, it's the place where God speaks to us. Uh, but preaching is not the same as teaching, it certainly has a teaching component. It's that illustration and application, I think, that makes preaching preaching. Sure, okay. And uh, we're to expect this every week from our pastors. Um... I, I'd hope so, yes. Certainly <laughs> when I go to church, uh, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Good, mm. good. And so, <clears throat> particularly today, we want to think about uh, how books might be able to help. Mm. pastors in particular and preachers and even lay preachers think about what they're doing mm. uh, what role do you see books playing in mm. the life of a pastor or a preacher yeah well I'd, I'd say that um, reading a book on preaching will not make a preacher any more that doing a, a preaching course even at Christ College doesn't make a preacher um, what books and courses can do is they give the scaffolding in which God grows the preacher so I think there's an issue of God's calling, of the giftedness, I think the experience. I, I think you learn to preach by preaching, certainly for myself. Um, I did a lot of preaching. In fact, I've never done a course on preaching myself. Um, so it's all being learned by doing it and reflecting on it, etc. But books are very important to cross-check your own thinking and to develop. Um, I started preaching, I think the first one was 1971, okay. which is a few years ago. And every year or so, I will make a point of reading a book on preaching, mm. and I'm finding even reading a basic introductory book on preaching after my what, 48 years, um, I will still gain things that means I'll think about something and continue growing. So, so books are there to help with the initial scaffolding and the continued growth. Yeah, you're not the first person who said that to me, actually. I've had um, other pastors say that they read a book a year on preaching yeah. um, mm. to help them in their work. Mm. Well, there you go. Sounds mm. a good habit. <laughs> And uh, now I'm, <clears throat> I've preached a few times, so I'm sort of starting. Mm. What what books would you perhaps suggest to begin with? Yeah, well, if I can um, grab a couple of these books we've got here, so um, two two books, in fact, both written by Australian authors. Um, Preaching a beginner's a guidebook for beginners by Alan Chapel from over at Trinity College in mm -hmm. WA. And then Saving Eutychus by Gary Miller and Phil Campbell, which comes out of QTC in Queensland. Uh, the great thing about Alan Chappell's book is that it takes you from a zero start and he pulls apart what preaching is, then it's nuts and bolts, step one, step two, etc. Um, it's not an exciting read, but it's a really, students in my classes tell me that this is a really great read if you're just beginning at the task and you really don't know where to begin. Mm. Saving Eutychus, as the title might imply, that's the reference to the guy in the Bible who had a sermon dropped out of the window, drop dead. And if that can happen to the Apostle Paul, it makes the rest <laughs> of us feel good. Um, so Gary Miller and Phil Campbell from QTC, they've written a book. It's idiosyncratic, as they say, an Irishman and an Australian walk into a pulpit. That's the, so it's got that kind of lively feel about it. Uh, but it's a really helpful book in terms of carrying you along and making you think about what preaching is and sharpening a number of those skills. Sure, okay. Um, Excellent, so good, good beginner books. And then if I wanted to dig a bit more into what preaching is and, <coughs> and the details behind that in more technicalities, perhaps, yeah. where would you then lead me? Yeah, well, a couple of classics that you might like to pass over to me. Um, so first of all, Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great Welsh preacher. So Martin mm. Lloyd-Jones was the physician, um, you know, set for the big medical career and all the rest of it. 
and then started preaching, never went to theological college, I'm not sure if I should mention that, um, <laughs> preached his heart out at Westminster Chapel and has written what has become quite a classic in the field. Mm. Um, Lloyd-Jones goes back to the big picture around preaching, something of the theology behind it, some thinking about the purpose of preaching. Even, I think the book was probably written 40 or so years ago, uh, but it's a good book to read to, to learn from a real master mm. of the craft and go back and think deeply. Um, he's got a style of preaching that we wouldn't necessarily do today, so you know, go through the Book of Romans over 16 years or something, kind of half a verse at a time. We tend to go in bigger slabs of Scripture, but there's much to gain from that. And then John Stott, um, always worth reading, and uh, this is part of an I Believe series. And Stott, of course, is a master preacher himself. I had the privilege of hearing him a few times and talking to him about his preaching, which was quite a bonus. And Stott, again, he gives you, there's a step-by-step -step guide, but also he goes back behind why do we preach. He talks about the authority of the Bible and how the Bible functions in preaching. And a really good thing always about Stott is he gets us to think about the audience mm. and who we're preaching to and how do we preach in a way that connects to people. Okay. In my mind, the heart of preaching is faithfulness to God's word and connection to the audience in front of you. Now, Stott's very good on both of those, and, and certainly the connection aspect, that's where he's a master. So those are two books to read, uh, a bit yeah, older, right. but, but both with much to teach. Yeah. Is, is there something you remember from that conversation with Stott around preaching? Um, so when I spoke to him, he would have been in his 80s, it was in the upstairs room in the uh, All Souls Rectory, and I just remember being impressed by, here's an older man who's been preaching for me, is he is still passionate Mm. about preaching and he takes it very seriously he, he doesn't just kind of cruise along old seven notes mm. yeah wonderful so even even <coughs> as they get older um preachers should still be yeah i i, I think so and uh, i'm 68 this year so i'm uh, f uh that's an issue for me i don't want to be one of those clapped out old pastors that you know, just drones away yeah, <laughs> everyone, yeah, yeah. everyone has a uticus moment <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. very good and one of the things you mentioned about stott uh, stott's book is that he, he helps you to connect with your audience. Hmm. Um, now, most churches have uh, sort of half men and half women, hmm. and preachers are, are men. And so uh, I've noticed a book here that you've, you've brought out yeah. is, is about how preaching can speak to women. Can you tell us a bit about yeah. this book? Yes, yeah, so you're dead right. At least half of our congregations typically will be female, and uh, preachers are basically going to be male. And I guess we all know not to use endless football or cricket illustrations in our <laughs> sermons, but it goes far deeper than that. I think there are different points of connection to women. There are different issues in their lives. I mean, at the heart, you know, God created us all in his image, mm. but at the very beginning, there's a male-female distinction. Yeah. And we are different, and that's really good. I'd hate to be married yeah, to yeah. myself, but I'm glad to be married to my wife. And... I just recall a few times over the years when my wife would talk about something that might have connected to her or didn't connect. And when I saw this book, I, I thought it was worth grabbing. Um, just as an example of this, my, my daughter, who's now an adult, spent six months in Germany on student exchange when she was 16. And she went to a church and there was a woman preaching. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when Meredith came back, we talked about it. And my daughter said how this lady preacher remarked that Jesus was a beautiful man. Hmm. And she said, you've never said anything like that. And I thought afterwards, no, I wouldn't, no. would I? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And so uh, I think women will hear differently. Women will see different things. There are particular issues in the lives of Christian women that need to be addressed by preachers. And I found this book useful just for helping me to understand a little better with some anal analytical mm -hmm. material mm -hmm. uh, to understand that half of the audience and to think about how to connect beyond not using beyond using netball as well as football <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's interesting too i think because uh a man hears that jesus is a beautiful man quite differently to perhaps how a woman would hear it yes mm. uh, has different picture in mind yeah so yeah yeah, yeah that sounds yeah. like a helpful book yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Good. yeah that's a good one yep yeah. uh and what you've been what you've been driving at a few times really is uh, i think you mentioned it in defining what preaching is mm. uh, preaching's broader than just uh, telling someone about something, um, yes, it's mm. it's more, uh, de it's deeper than that. Mm. You're, you're, I think before this interview, you said it's transformation, not 
education? Yes, so one, one way of thinking about uh, teaching is that the goal of teaching is transmission of information, then yep. has, can the student recall and produce it back to you and analyse and apply. Whereas with preaching, it's information for transformation and mm. you want to see a whole life change. That's the real goal of preaching. That's 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17 to form people as mature Christians. Yeah. Mm. And so there's a couple of books yep. that you've, you've pulled out here that yep. uh, you found helpful to, to that yep. regard. Yep. So the first one, a pretty old book. In fact, it was yeah, written absolutely. in the 1580s in Latin first up, translated to English. But thankfully, people like Banner of Truth keep publishing it now. The Art of Prophesying by William Perkins. Uh, we hear the word prophesying today and we think mm -hmm. of something different. He means preaching. And this, I think, would be one of the very earliest English Protestant books on preaching that we can read today and see a likeness in our approach as to how we'd go about it. Um, Perkins is very strong in taking us... He, he sees the task of the preacher is, is to interpret and apply the text. Right. And he's very skillful in terms of talking about the heart of the listener and talking about different kinds of listeners mm. and what the need of that person is. So say with the person who's not yet a Christian, they perhaps don't need your sermon on the difference between Eutychian and Nestorian Christology, but they do need to hear that Jesus is the Lord who can save them by his death and mm. how to achieve mm. that. So Perkins is good in attuning us to our audience. He's particularly interested in the heart, the, the inner person of the audience, and in helping to develop applications there. Uh, most of us as preachers struggle with application, so books like these two are good. Um, Murray Capel's book uh, is the best book that I've read on application. Um, I used to say it was the only book, but then I remembered I'd read Perkins. Um, Capel picks up on some of the older literature. A really strong section is he goes back to the Puritan writers, Edwards and so on, for an analysis of the heart. Sure. And the distinction between things like feelings and emotions, mm. which are on the surface, but often we think confuse that with the heart, and Cable gets us to go burrow down and to get to the affections. Yeah. As a preacher, what you want to get to is not feelings and emotions because they'll disappear with the next pizza. Yep. What you want to get to is to the deep issue of the affections and will of the audience. So how does he def define affections? <clears throat> He would talk it into, yes, um, not in terms of uh, I like my puppy dog or a yeah, cafe yeah, yeah. lover. Um, the deepest loves and loyalties that yeah, exactly. drive our whole lives. Yeah. So his argument would be that if we transform those affections at the deep level of the heart, that will result in change mm. behaviour and hence the heart is the target. Mm. So he's very good at analysing the heart and then helping preachers to um, address different parts of it. Even after my 58 years of preaching, whatever it is, 48 years of preaching, um, I still find that getting applications right, the danger is you're so general, yep. or every week it's read your Bible, pray, yeah, evangelize yeah, your neighbor. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, all that. <laughs> um, most of us continue to struggle with applications, and books like this help us develop applications that are driven by the text into people's lives. Hmm. Now, perhaps one, one of the difficulties with application itself is... Uh, that you, the gen, I think why we lean to general applications is that we don't want to be legalistic. We don't be, want to be telling people how to live. Hmm. So how how do these books help you to differentiate between a legalistic approach to application and hmm. still still move away from that general sort of? Yes, sure. That's where the analysis of where the listener is at. And so for the person who's in Christ, you're then looking to make applications with in terms of let's now talk about what does it mean to live a life worthy of Christ or in Romans 12, what does it mean to present your whole self as a mm. living sacrifice? Um, and so you're going to probe into family life, work life and so on, but always grounding it back in Christ as being the motivation for it. Um, another writer talks about the danger of the be sermon, you know, be good, be a Bible reader, yeah, yeah, etc. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas what we want to say is be uh, a follower of Christ, be someone who believes in Christ with repentance and confession and let that drive your behaviour. Yeah, yeah. Mm. sure. Wonderful. Yeah. Seem like very important books to read. Um, and then one of, the, one of the things that I see in, in my pastor and, and in many pastors is that there's lots and lots of different things that they have to do. They have to plan ministries, they have to mm. organise meetings, they have to do mm. Bible studies and all sorts mm. of Tell things. Me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so is there, is there a book that can help us, help pastors 
in terms of understanding where preaching should sit in their priority list? Sure, yes. As I um, mentioned before, we'd see, certainly in our college, we work very much on a shepherding metaphor where the yep. Bible gives us. That's the language 1 Peter 5 and so on. Um, for the pastor, and that's where we get our feed, lead, care. And so we want students to think about a balance between those. Uh, but a book that is very helpful in terms of thinking about the priority of preaching is, well, here it is, it's got that very title, <laughs> The Priority of Preaching. So Christopher Ash, I've uh, had the opportunity of um, working with Christopher on a few projects. In fact, I wrote one of the blurbs for this book, so I, I do yeah. recommend it. Um, this is a series of talks he gave to preachers at the Evangelical Ministers' Assembly in London, I think it was, a series of talks from Deuteronomy. And it's not a how-to book, but it is a book that encourages pastors to keep preaching as the central part mm. of their ministry. So whatever else you do, make sure that you are feeding God's people well. I guess if you think of a household illustration, whatever else uh, a parent might do, yep, keeping yep. the house neat and tidy is nice, getting the kids to yep. netball on time is good, but whatever else you do, feed the kids well. And that's kind of where Christopher Ash goes. So I, I read this book on a weekend. I'd flown from Singapore to Sydney to conduct a niece's wedding. Then I got on a plane after a wedding reception on Saturday afternoon, flew back to Singapore, preached twice the next day, and I read this book in the kind of pre-publisher's proof, and I found that I bounded from the plane to the pulpit, because oh, I was just so encouraged by this book that what I do as a preacher is the most important thing I do for my congregation, feed them well. Mm. One particular thing that struck me in this book is it talks about the relationship of small groups and preaching. Um, many of us would have small groups, and we'd see them as a valuable adjunct to our ministry. I've been in a habit of getting the small groups to look at the same passage okay. that I'm preaching on before the sermon. Before, okay. So they look at it, get warmed up on it, then they come and hear the sermon, etc. Whereas Ash makes the point, hang on, he says, you're the key teacher of the congregation. He thinks the order should be that you preach at first, so you're doing the teaching and the principal applications, then it goes to the small groups where they're talking about detailed mm, individual applications. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm quite persuaded by that. And he makes the remark that small groups, they require university kind of skills of being able to read text, uh, talk about it, discuss it. And there's lots of people in churches that don't have those skills. Uh, not everybody's an arts graduate. <laughs> yeah. um, and so just a book that's a great encouragement to pastors, keep it central in your week. Yep. And do it well. Yeah, yeah, good. And so to that end, um, we we have the Bible to preach from, yeah. which you mentioned, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, the, and two thirds of it, as it turns out, is made up of the Old Testament. Mm. Um, so, is there something that can help us preach the Old Testament? Look, I'd say first of all that that I think would be the major challenge for most preachers. If you look at a preacher's Bible, like that of a Christian, you'll find the New Testament pages are well thumbed and are falling out. The Old Testament might be pretty pristine, and the gold edgings thing is still there. Um, we often struggle in making applications from the Old Testament because it's before Jesus. We haven't got the direct gospel link. So how do we make sense? You, you hear of some horror stories. I mean, the, the one you often hear is. Uh, uh, Joshua 4, the Rahab episode, Rahab lets the spies out and we give them the detail in the text that she's got a red rope yep. that she uses. That clearly is the blood of Jesus saving us, um, apparently in the mind of some okay. preachers. Yeah. <laughs> so we could probably do better than that. So a couple of books that can help there. Um, Graham Goldsworthy, again, Australia punches above its weight in some of these fields. Um, Goldsworthy, he'll get, when I was a very new Christian, I was going to the Evangelical Union at Sydney University and Goldsworthy was teaching at Moore College. He'd come over to the EU and we kind of got his books without having to buy them. Goldsworthy's approach is very much wrapped around the idea of the kingdom, God's people under God's rule in God's place. And he sees the whole Bible unfolding around the, uh, the kingdom established in Eden, uh, lost in the fall, promised, restored, anticipated in David and then coming in Jesus. And this helpful book by Goldsworthy supplements some of his other books in that, as the title suggests, preaching the whole Bible as Christian scripture. He gives an introductory section with a whole lot of really helpful principles for what we call our hermeneutic mm -hmm. or interpretation. So we don't, we know the whole Bible points towards Jesus and arises from Jesus, but we don't want to be clunky or f yeah, yeah. forced in the way we handle yeah, the Old yeah. Testament. And he's giving a methodology that enables you to take an Old Testament passage, put it into a good perspective, 
as to how it points towards Jesus, which might be showing the need for Jesus. Um, it might be uh, setting up a pattern or a type that is fulfilled in Jesus. It might be a prediction of Jesus and so on. Um, and so he has the introductory material. Then he goes through the major divisions of the Bible and shows you how to do it. So it's a great little book. Now you're preaching, you're assigned to preach on Zechariah and think, what do I do? You just turn to Goldsworthy and, and he'll give you something to start thinking about, even if you don't agree with his whole approach. But the premier book probably in this would be, so Brian Chappell, who's uh, in fact coming out to Australia later this year, I think, yes. to Christ College. And, and we bring him out because we think he's got a great approach. He's very much known for what he calls redemptive preaching. So we all want to keep Christ at the centre and his redemption, but how do we do that without being legalistic or clunky? Um, Chapel's probably distinctive note is the thing called the fallen condition focus, right. FCF. Okay. So I'll give you that. I'll, I'll give you uh, yeah. that and the gist here. Yeah. So the gist of it is that all of Scripture addresses humanity in our deficiency arising from the fall. So okay. all the Bible is responding to fallenness and sinfulness. Yep. Fallenness is the general human condition arising from the fall. Sinfulness is you and me, our individual sins. Right, so the whole of Scripture addresses us in our fallenness. Every text then is responding to some deficiency in us caused by fall or sin. The task of the preacher then is to do your exegesis, figure out what is it Mm. about human fallenness or sinfulness that this text was addressing in the original context. You then ask the question, what's the parallel, what's the point of contact between our lives and that original condition of the text? Next step is to ask, how does the text address that issue of human fallenness in the original context, and then how's that going to apply to my hearers? It's just beautiful. It takes a bit of work for students to learn how to develop the fallen condition focus. We practice that in class here. But once students get it, it's just breathtaking hmm. because those applications that are, fa- that are driven by the text that keep Jesus central relate to real lives, those applications just fall out. So it really is just a superb book and approach. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And, if, and if people want to know more, they can come along and... Come along to Christ College. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Well, uh, thank you very much, David. Perhaps one last question before we go is, is there, as you have read over the years, and uh, lots of different books, and, as, as we can see in your office here, um, is there maybe a little tip or something that you've found helpful in your reading to get the most out of a book? Um, to read slowly, allow a bit of time, take notes. Um, I'll often, if I've bought the book, um, which of course you should do from reformers, um, I'll just have a pencil and make notes, and then I will try and summarise the key points from each chapter at the introduction page of that chapter as I go, and, and I can go back to that easily. I find that helpful. As I was thumbing through some of these books, I found your notes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you for that, and thank you very much for your time. Great. Good to be with you.